point. All right. Hello, and welcome to the Understanding Families podcast. Today, it's my pleasure to interview Professor Judith Smith. Dr. Smith is a clinical social worker, therapist, researcher, and professor at Fordham University. She's a leader in gerontological research, focusing on women's experiences as they age. Her recent book, which is excellent, Difficult, Mothering Challenging Adult Children Through Conflict and Change was just released earlier this month in February. It is a great and important book. So Judith, your excellent new book, Difficult, uh, mothering adult children was based on eight years of research and interviews. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. yeah. How how do you define difficult? Well, I started out doing qualitative research, and so it came out of the research. I mean, I was I started out trying to. I, mean, I my background is as a child development person. Oh, uh -huh. so I spent years observing mothers and babies, studying mothers and babies. Um, and then I got older and my son got older and uh, I started looking at what my colleagues were writing about uh, parenting in later life. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked at the absence of a real dialogue about this. And I got interested in mother's experiences as their kids age. I mean, as our kids age, it's the longest time that we have with them. It's you know, true. from 21, I mean, if you, now we're living, my Fred's mother just celebrated her 109th birthday. Wow. <laughs> She's been a daughter for a long time. <laughs> and, um, that's going to be what many young people are going to experience and mothers experience this too. And people have not yet really talked about how that relationship changes over time. And I was interested particularly in women's internal experience, if particularly if the kids were struggling. Yeah. And why did you decide to focus more on mothers than fathers, for example? Well, initially, it was a practical decision as a qualitative researcher. I couldn't, I couldn't compare them. But right. I am a feminist. And I do believe that um, the name parenting or the name caregiving is a misnomer because it assumes it's a gender neutral, equally shared activity. And I am one of many women who don't see it that way. I mean, men certainly are becoming much more engaged, but I think how each of men and women process these responsibilities are different. Yeah, no, I completely agree. In my practice, as you know, I focus on estranged parents and the vast majority of parents who contact me are, are mothers. And in my survey of 1600, the strange parents that I did to the University of Wisconsin Survey Center, I think 90% of the parents who participated in it were mothers. So why do you think that is? Why do you think that more mothers than fathers contact me for help with their estrangement? I mean, you know, if I was younger, I would be starting now my second book about father's experiences. And certainly there are many dads who are very hurt by seeing their children's you know, helplessness, sure. mental illness. Um, but I do think from what I learned from the moms and is that women's self-esteem and sense of self is very much uh, affected by how our kids are doing. Mm -hmm. that I, you know, if you see two older women or, or two 40 year old women meeting, you know, at the grocery right. store, the first question is how are the kids? Right. Yeah. So, you know, how our kids are is how we feel. And actually, Karen Fingerman um, did a study that proved that you are only as happy as your least happy child. Right. So, um, you know, it's it's, you know, I think it's a long, deep story. I talk also about the um, sociological aspect of uh, what is expected of women and the sense of we should be perfect, we should be able to do everything, we should be able to fix everything. I mean, the Madonna is the perfect. And I think each of us internalizes it. We all think mm -hmm. that we should be able to fix what's wrong with our kids. And if there is something wrong with our kids, clearly it's we sent them to the wrong school or we did this, <laughs> we did the wrong things. 
Yeah, I see that so much in these estranged parents. Mothers in particular, I rarely hear fathers saying this, but I hear so many estranged mothers say, well, only if I had done X or Y, you know, or only if I had done A, B, or C. And I think part of it is, this is the subject of, of a book that I'm currently writing, is really the fault of my field of psychotherapy, where we have this idea that everything comes back to parental, uh, parental, parental mistakes, dysfunctional families. And there's this now this big search for hidden traumas. And there's this presumption that if an adult child ends up with psych psychological problems, dysfunctions, pathology, that it must be something that was was with the parents. There's this great quote by the sociologist Eva Luz. She said, today our lives are implotted backwards. What's a dysfunctional family? It's a family where your needs aren't met. How do you know that your needs weren't met? By looking at your present condition. So there's this kind of blame the parent, which almost always means blame the mother. That's very popular in our culture and very, very common um, in my field, problematically um, of psychotherapy. So to get back to your other point about why it costs mothers more, I remember years ago reading Car Carol Gilligan's work, and she talked about women's being women being more likely to define themselves in relation, kind of what you were saying. If you ask a, a, a woman how she's doing, she's much more likely to talk about relationships where commonly, and I think this is still true, you ask men, they're more likely to talk about their work or their achievements or their, their hobbies. And I would imagine that that's also particularly makes the the relationship with difficult children um, much more painful for moms. Would you say that's right? Yeah. Um, I mean, you asked before how I came up with the name of difficult. Um, I started, I didn't know what mothers, I was looking at all as a gerontologist. I was interested in women. I started with women over 60. I included a few 57 year olds, but um, <laughs> So I went to senior centers. I didn't know what, you know, I asked what has, for kid, people who have kids over 40, what are the problems in their lives that are affecting you? Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what I would find. And what I did find was the adult child's substance use and mental illness and chronic unemployment. Um, those were the primary issues that uh, mothers were experiencing and partially because those problems in the adult kids, I think this is what's different from the little I know of your work, mm -hmm. is that the problems in the adult kids' lives led them to come back home. Right, yeah. Those kids are not able to be self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. The uh, families are faced with the dilemma of I mean, every woman I talked to initially opened her door to her adult child. I mean, I realized in thinking about this interview, there were a few women who spoke with me who had estranged kids, mm -hmm. um, which was different. They obviously didn't open their door because nobody was knocking, but the majority were adult children who needed often a place to live yeah. and emotional support. And so you know, the choice is to take in and to let them stay or to kick them out and have them face homelessness. Um, and that's a terrible choice for any parent. It's such a terrible choice. Yeah. And um, I mean, that gets to the concept of tough love, which we seem to just love the concept in our society. Um, why do you think that concept is so important? And why is it not applicable here? I think the concept of tough love, the concept of an, a mother being an enabler, or even codependency, just don't resonate for me um, in my research. Or, um, you know, these are kids who cannot bounce back, you uh -huh. know. It, and I think our society is, I mean, I really, you know, I am a social change person, but I didn't think this book was going to be about uh, the need for structural change. But mm -hmm. that really is where I ended up. Um, mm -hmm. And I think where I may go in the next part of my life is more as an advocate. I mean, I think yeah. families cannot do this alone. And yeah. our mental health system is just atrocious. So, I mean, I think if families had a choice to say, you go live in that subsidized housing down the block, and if you're nice, I'll invite you for dinner. Right. <laughs> And you have it, then you could do tough love. But right. if tough love means your child is going to be homeless, maybe killed, that's, 
But sometimes I met many mothers who had to do that. And we have some excellent elder abuse social workers who are helping families who have to do this. Um, mm -hmm. And there are services, there are, especially in bigger cities, there are places, certainly not enough. And the housing issue is, just makes it impossible. No, I think you're raising such an important point that as a culture, we do such a terrible job of supporting families. It seems like every politician, you know, runs on the campaign that I'm pro-family, but there's very, very little done in this country to really support families. So then parents, mothers in particular, become the, the final resting place for these kids who are, it's either that or prison, right? Because there's no longer a mental health center for them to go to, you know, since Reagan. There used to be long-term hospitalizations available for people with chronic psychiatric illnesses, but today it's either home, the streets, or prison. Um, and so, um, so I think you're raising such an important point. And yeah, the, the notion of tough love implies that that these kids have the resources to draw upon. And so many of them don't have the resources. And you're right, the parent is faced between um, a kid who's either gonna be out on the streets and homeless or suicidal or robbed or beaten or um, have in the midst of some kind of a psychotic episode or staying at home and unfortunately making their parents chronically worried. So that gets me to another point. You, you use the phrase chronic sorrow in your book, which I think is such a poignant and apt um, term. Can you say more about, about that term and how you came to that? Um, well, first I was hearing it in women's stories. Um, one mom told me whose son, uh, she supported him you know, through his, for 20 years he was homeless and, but she managed to stay in contact with him and um, he eventually suicided. Oh. He was diabetic, it might've been whatever. Mm. Um, but she described that when her first grandson was born from her, she had other children, which should have been this extreme moment. Of course, yeah, joy, yeah. Like she could just think of her first, First child's birth, uh, who was this child who had died. Mm -hmm. And she felt so guilt guilty <laughs> that she was, you know, sorrowful. And then looking for the literature, it was a concept used, and I'm not going to remember his name right now, um, like 50 years ago, working with parents of Down syndrome kids. Mm -hmm. Don't know. Where at the time, the, the helping means used to be to tell parents, you know, let go, this is over, right. move on, have another child. And he came, oh, Shronsky, I think, mm. uh, came up with this concept of chronic sorrow. And I think mm -hmm. it's so apt for parents. You know, the people who were in my study had to have kids who were on a normal track. I mean, mm -hmm. they were born with severe cerebral palsy or severe mm -hmm. brain uh, injuries. Mm -hmm. They were kids who got through high school, looked like they were, oh. and they, so mothers each talked about the potential of their kids. And mm -hmm. this one was a good singer. This one was a good artist. This one was this. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was not able to materialize. That probably makes them much more vulnerable to the self-blame, um, doesn't it? This kind of idea that they were on this good, healthy trajectory. So it makes it much more tempting for the parent to feel like, well, they were doing so well until I did X or Y and to kind of overemphasize some Maybe it may have been a parental mistake, but 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 whether it was transformative in the way that the parent imagines it is, and, and in a way that produces such guilt and shame, um, it is inaccurate. And I think that's part of what contributes to the, the chronic sorrow. I think that you're you're describing, and it's not how they envision their future lives or their children's no. future lives. Whereas right. I think. Uh, the concept of perpetual parents was created to talk about moms whose kids have a severe disability at birth. So in your mind, mm -hmm. this is going to be your life. But, you know, for mothers, I mean, and I try to lay out the trajectory of mothering following one woman and how things change. Mm -hmm. uh, first 10 years, it's this will be a new start. And she'd find her mentally ill daughter. She had the resources to put her in a separate apartment. Mm -hmm. So she'd fix it up nicely. It was safe. It, you know, and then the girl would become paranoid and she'd have to move her again so that for 20 years, this will be a new start. Yeah. And then at some point the daughter, 
uh, broke into their summer house, which had a lot of personal, and she really felt like she had crossed the line. And the family almost cut her off, but they did not. But they did stop fixing up new houses, you know, would pay for motels, you know, much less grand. And, um, and, and then the next thing was, I'm running out of gas, you know, that as sure. the mom, I'm getting older. Yeah. This is my life. I have a husband. And then the final stage is, you know, what happens when I'm gone? Mm-hmm. Right. This, um, you know, particularly you know, thinking about who, if you've been a hands-on parent, who is going to step in? Mm-hmm. You can find a bank who will give the money if you happen to have money, which, um, but nobody can replace you. And so mm-hmm. that's, um, you know, it's hard. It's so hard. Yeah, you talk about that very eloquently in your book about sort of the chronic feelings of fear. Is there more that you can say about that? I mean, that that's, captures it well, but is there more to say about that ongoing feeling of fear that these mothers of difficult children have? Well, I think you worry for their own, vulner, for the kids' vulnerability. And yeah. I think that the, I mean, my book is difficult adult children, but it's really difficult mothering. Mm-hmm. And it's facing your own powerlessness. I mean, we cannot cure mental illness. We cannot get somebody to go off drugs. Right. Um, so it has to be up to the kid. But I, I do think, I know you are able and have a whole program for helping par- parents to address the estrangement. Doesn't mean I'm always successful. I have a problem. Yeah, exactly. Uh-huh. But I think, I think in the situation with kids who have serious, you know, illnesses, there's not a direct route. Um, actually, there was somebody commented on my Facebook page last night that um, she'd read my book. She'd been disconnected from her son, had kicked him out. After reading the book, she got in touch with her, what she called her maternal side, mm. and she reconnected him to him, which she regretted. Mm. Um, so I said to her, I think that the maternal side is both. I mean, what I talk about is ambivalence and yeah. that there is an intern, you know, a forever conflict for all parents, not only right. uh, difficult kids. You know, we have two jobs. We have the job to be there in crisis and always be there when our kids need us. Mm-hmm. And they also have the job to make sure they're independent and launch them. And I think Carl Pilmer was, you know, who mm. I consider my intellectual mentor, mm. really named ambivalence. And he brought it into, he's one of the only people who really talks about older parents and their adult children. Um, that this is a central conflict when our kids are six and eight and 12, and it continues. And, um, but it's much harder when the kids don't fully have the launching capacity. Yeah. But I, also, I think I was very touched by, um, I can't remember, I'm not gonna remember her name. Who's the woman who started the recovery movement. Um, <laughs> Patricia, <laughs> it will come to me. But when she was 16, she was diagnosed as schizophrenic. Mm. This was a long time ago. She's now you know, in her late 60s. And the doctor said, avoid stress, stay home. She was an athlete. She was, you know, she was everything, stay home. Mm. So she sat there smoking in her room. And, but her grandmother would come every day and knock on the door and say, Patricia, you want to go shopping? And for three months, Patricia said, no. And then she... But she would just knock. She wouldn't then say, you know, you idiot. <laughs> you know. Uh-huh. And then she knocked again. And Patricia said, okay, but I'm not going to push the cart. <laughs> so she went, they went food shopping. And she said, her grandmother was saying, there's a world out here. And mm-hmm. I think that's one thing that we can do as parents who have kids who are struggling. You know, we, I have a section, I have a whole section of resources and ways to take care of yourself. Mm. Um, and there's one piece is taking care of your adult child, which is being aware of what resources there are, mm-hmm. maybe finding the moment when there's some 
you know, pleasant time to say, oh, you know, I just saw this great new, you know, rehab center that opened up down the block. I mean, that you have to find your timing. You can't be nagging. Right. Uh, and to, you know, the social workers who I write about in my book who are working with, you know, abusive adult children who are in the house who've really violated boundaries over and over again and the mother's scared and they teach moms to very gradually set tiny boundaries mm -hmm. like kid says you know give me they're watching tv together and the kid says give me the remote and the mom can say you know i think you can reach it mm -hmm. sure. you, know, the, you you can gradually teach moms to do small boundaries and to start taking better care of themselves so that, and I, I have a depression scale in my book to ask mm. people to, um, because depression in mothers and fathers too has been linked to elder abuse because if you are um, depressed, you feel much less capable of standing up sure. and getting help. And so I suggest to the readers of my book that they take the easy 10 item depression scale and bring it to their physicians because depression is treatable. Mm -hmm. And if you can feel better, you have more energy to be able to think about renegotiating in a way that you won't be so hurt, which, well, I mean, no adult child, I don't think, really wants to hurt their parent. I mean, it's I a terrible. No, I completely, I completely agree. Um, but I think you're pointing out the, the topic of, of self care for somebody who's going through something like this is really critical. And I think for mothers, they do feel more um, guilty about um, self-care in the midst of a kid who's suffering so much to sort of feel like, well, what right do I have to, to happiness or to spend time without my child or not to be thinking about my child or to put my child out of my, my mind or to do things away from the home, home when my child has such an unhappy life. And I think it's such a critical thing for mothers in particular to get their hands around that it isn't an either or that you can be a great loving dedicated mother and still take care of yourself and it's really like the overused analogy of the taking the oxygen on your mask first on the on the airplane you have to be able to to take care of yourself particularly with a kid is really challenging in the way that these kids are yeah and they you know um joanne siri from cornell weill who has an intervention program with moms who are depressed and being abused by their kids. Hmm. They work with them to, you know, let's say if you, some mothers do go for a walk. I mean, that's something that's go out for half an hour. Right. And they find if you go for a walk with another person, that in some ways that it's expanding your, you know, that it's small, I call the middle part of my book, small steps that, mm -hmm. you know, to even begin to think of changing things for your own benefit is terrifying for mothers and for women. And sure. it's possible and it will help everybody. Yeah, no, completely agree. I had Pauline Boss on recently to talk about her new book, The Myth of Closure. And this seems like a very relevant uh, concept here with your research on difficult adult children, both the myth of closure and the other concept of ambiguous loss. It certainly seems that having a difficult adult child is a, is a, um, is an ambiguous loss when you, well, yeah, I think you write about that in your book, don't you? I think you mentioned it somewhere. Oh, yes. I think so. Right. No, it's hard to remember the things we read. I have the same thing. One of your readers, one of the listeners has read it. And read I know. <laughs> I have the same thing when people quote me. Did I say that? Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you, you, I think you are more likely to use the phrase disenfranchised grief, um, which is kind of a, a parallel concept. But I yeah. Think she, she has a citation. She Holy does. Months, yeah. uh, okay. <laughs> Um, well, um, in terms of, of abuse, would you consider estrangement a form of, of elder abuse? No. Mm -hmm. I mean, not how it's defined. I mean, I also, one of the first papers I wrote before I got to this book was, as I was doing this research, here were moms who were actually in contact with elder abuse services, not one of them in the 180 minutes I talked with them used the word abuse. Mm -hmm. 
First of all, they don't think they're old. I mean, I don't think <laughs> anybody thinks they're an elder. And they don't think their kids are abusive. They think they're annoying. They think they're difficult. They think they're aggressive. They think maybe they're mentally ill, but not abusive. I mean, I think we need to find a better word. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think parents may f feel like they're being certainly hurt by their adult child. And it certainly works not to speak to your parent um but mm -hmm. i don't think it gets classified as as abuse in, uh -huh. in in the field yeah well i guess abuse does imply a kind of an intention to hurt and to wound and the like wouldn't, wouldn't you i mean although we could we could envision a situation it, it probably would be applied because i think the actual definition is uh within a trusting relationship uh the use of power against someone who you have a trusting relationship with. So yeah, that, they would apply. Yeah, it seems like there's there's a case for it. Um, um, and a related question, it seems like the notion of who's difficult and who isn't can sometimes be in the eyes of the the beholder, what, what might be a difficult child for one parent might not be difficult for the other. Um, did you find that fathers were A, less likely to let the child back into the home and B, less likely to um believe that the behavior was abusive or um or not necessarily i wasn't I never to the dads I, see. Um, I mean one mom described her husband as the good cop and she was the bad cop mm -hmm. um so vice versa from what you're saying so i'm i was sure. not in a position to really compare them okay right. yeah Okay. Um, how has the pandemic exacerbated this? Do you feel like it has? Well, certainly. Yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it's the people, one mom, um, when kids move in, um, who have suddenly lost their earning power and have, you know, an unrecognized anger problem, and you're living together in a tiny space. Um, so elder abuse, domestic violence, all were up in the pandemic. And because social isolation is very much related to um, family violence, because you need people to have eyes on the what's going on. And uh, you need to be able to call people. You need to be able to call your other kids when things. And I give safety plans for, I mean, I do not see all difficult kids as elder abuse, but I became mm. interested in the problem because I was aware that the primary perpetrator of elder abuse is an adult child living at home. Oh, uh-huh. That's interesting. So, um, mm -hmm. I was curious about that. It didn't make sense to me as a psychotherapist and a child development person. And so that sort of got me interested in this, thinking about older parents and their adult kids. Uh-huh. Um, that's interesting. Well, getting back to your earlier point about ambivalence, which I, I agree is such a rich kind of underexplored topic, particularly the research that shows that ambivalence can create a lot of unhappiness in ways that I don't think we commonly think about. Um, but related to that, you talk about feelings of hatred on the mother's part. And I think in, I think in the spirit of wanting to normalize some of that, can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, mothers... You know, some moms that would say, I wish I never, this child wasn't born, that I wouldn't mm -hmm. be in this dilemma. Um, and when you feel trapped by someone mm -hmm. and you feel like you cannot, one mom lived in New York City her whole life. She was low income, wanted desperately to have, her daughter has lived with her. Uh, her daughter had ADHD. They fight constantly. It's a tiny apartment. She would like to have a few years peace, as she said in her later life. As she had a friend who moved out west and decided she could afford there. And so she was talking to me as if this was happening. But then she would tell me, but there's no way I can go. I, she'll, mm -hmm. you know, I, mm -hmm. she won't survive without me. Yeah. And she, you, know, you hate somebody who you feel is entrapping you. Um, For sure, yeah. You know, but I use her as an example is that she was not able to really see the two sides of the pole. I mean, I think as a psychotherapist, I'm sure what you do as well, what we offer people, one of our main tools 
is to look at both sides of the picture. And right. the more we can openly see how we love and hate or people who we're close to, then we can live it. We can, it's okay to be in the relationship. I mean, I think the very early parenting groups for mothers with colicky babies to be mm -hmm. able to say it's normal to want, you know, Right. Who hate your child in the middle of the night who won't start stop crying. Mm -hmm. uh, that I think mothers, it's Rosika Parker, who I think's book uh, Torn in Two, mm -hmm. so wonderful, um, groundbreaking, but she's no longer alive, of how women have been in prison because we're not able to acknowledge our mixed feelings for our children. Yeah. You know, you're a bad mom if you feel... Um, you know, I finally, I think we're having the dialogue with the lost child film and everybody's, you know, but that's mm -hmm. greater ambivalence where she actually walks away, but on a moment to moment wow. basis, how we, you know, mental health is being able to tolerate our mixed feelings and um, people who've grown up in a lot of stress and haven't had, you know, an environment that supported that are less able to tolerate their mixed feelings. Yeah, no, I think that's well said. And I certainly see with the estranged mothers in my practice that their feelings of anger or desires to push back or tell their kids that they're fed up with them or whatever, they have much more guilt and conflict about it. So where, you know, whereas the dads can commonly feel like, well, screw that kid, you know, I'm not gonna apologize to them, they need to apologize to me. You know, mm -hmm. for mothers, there's always the feeling like, well, there's something else I could be doing or should be doing, does it make me a bad person that I feel so mad at my kid or that I wanna give up on them or that I feel so frustrated. And um, I think moms need, a, women need much more help kind of navigating that, that, um, that turf. Um, well, you've been very generous with your time. I have a few more questions if you're sure. ready, ready to keep going. <laughs> you use the term social clocks in your book, which I hadn't really heard before. How do you, how do you define social clocks? Um, well, the life course people um, have introduced the concept. Mm -hmm. The idea that I think it's changing. I, when I teach this in my classes, I think just, like when I, like 15 years ago, I'd say to my class, what's, what's the right time to get married? Mm -hmm. And they'd have a debate, you know, 26, 22. Now you say it and they look at you like, you know, who's going to get married, you know? <laughs> like, but, um, you know, our generation, you know, there's a certain time when you're supposed to move out of your parents' house. There's a certain right. time when you're supposed to go back, finish college. A certain time you're supposed to get married. Mm -hmm. A certain time when you should have nice furniture um, mm -hmm. that we have ideas of what life what a grown-up is supposed to do and when people are not meeting those expected timetables and it you know, comes back to the sorrow of not seeing your kids you know meet those yeah. accomplishments but you know with difficult adult kids they can have kids Mm -hmm. and, um, and one mom wrote to me when the Art New York Times article came out, she's a psychologist and her grief at seeing her daughter not be a good parent. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that that's the quality of it. But there is an expectation that we each carry of what in our society is valued as healthy and normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in terms of the social clock, kind of the, the sequ sequencing of events over the life course. Yeah. Um, okay, well, final question, Judy, what, we've touched on this a little bit already, but can you say a little bit more about your recommendations for moms who find themselves in this situation? I think social support is the most important. Mm -hmm. um, I think if you have a child with mental illness, I think NAMI is a wonderful organization. Agree. If you have a child with uh, addiction, Al-Anon is a group that helps, helps some people. Other people have mixed feelings about it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that being able to talk more openly to your friends and family about this, I think the secrecy that goes with mm -hmm. these problems and the stigma that families feel make you so much more isolated. 
Mm -hmm. And I think social support is essential. Good, yeah. And also is counseling and therapy. If you're not able to, you know, to, to be able to walk into a NAMI meeting. I mean, right. Actually, Leslie Carpenter, who's my poster child for somebody who became an advocate and really used her grief at not being able to fix her child's situation. Mm -hmm. But it took her four years to get to NAMI. Wow. Uh, because she and her husband said, we're too busy. You know, we're working. We have to make sure our, we don't want to add something else to mm -hmm. our lives. So I think many people avoid uh, taking that night off to go to a NAMI meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, but their family to family program is 10 sessions. People can do it. Um, but I think finding some way where you can be a whole person and be able to acknowledge this is part of your life. You, this is, you have a difficult, I mean, what I'm hoping is, and it seems to be happening. People now are writing to me, well, I have a difficult adult child. I mean, this word never existed before. <laughs> you you know? probably felt guilty about calling it that. No, so you're probably, no, I think you're normalizing I think it. I think it's less pejorative than saying my son's an addict. I agree. Yeah. Saying there's mental illness in my family. I have a difficult adult child. Mm -hmm. And something that's difficult, you can make it less difficult. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think. I do think there are resources um, to help your child and there are resources to help you. Certainly not enough. The housing problem is terrible. But you can also become an advocate to help there be more affordable housing um, that somehow as adults to be able to use your energy to do something to help yourself, help your world and, you know, be in touch with the limits of what you can do for your kid. And hopefully if you're in a better place and are open to them, they will use you when they are able to. Yeah. I think it's very well said, and, and the importance of community is so important to reduce the feelings of shame and social isolation and feeling like it's all you, and there's something very, very healing about talking with other parents who are going through the exact same thing. You can feel like, oh, I, I know what that's like, and yeah, it's enormously powerful. Well, thank you so much, Judy. This is really, really helpful. I know it's going to be for my audience as well. How, how can people find you or your book? What, what do you recommend? Um, what's being sold on all the online uh, platforms. Mm -hmm. Amazon's a little, you know, I, I think it's being sold more than people expected, but it's, <laughs> and um, I'm Judith R. Smith, PhD on Twitter. My website is Difficult Mothering and I'm on Facebook. I have a Facebook page uh, called Difficult Mothering. And I hope to be doing events and maybe having a book club for people to talk about the book. And I'd like people to be in contact with me because I'm still learning about people's experiences. Well, great. I think it's a great book and an enormous resource. And I think it's a huge contribution to our field. So I'm so glad that you wrote it and that I got a chance to read it and uh, interview you. So thanks so much. We got to meet. Thank you so much. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.